in Acts chapter number 2. If you think back to our recent Sunday services, then you may remember that I've been preaching a series of messages that I've entitled, Holy Who? Holy Who? It is a series of messages that I've been preaching on the subject of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, one of the reasons or the main reason that I've been preaching about the Holy Spirit in recent weeks is because there's a lot of ignorance and a lot of indifference when it comes to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. I told you last Sunday that if you went out on the average street in the average town of America and talked to the average person and asked them who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our world today, you would probably get an answer somewhat similar to this right here. He said it to them, have you, believe, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And here's what they said, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. You know, in a lot of our, uh, a lot of uh, uh, people, non-church scores in America, their answer would be, hey, I've not even heard. We don't even know anything about the Holy Ghost. But what's so uh, tragically true about that, also, if you stop the average church member as they exit church this Sunday morning on their way home and ask them about the person and the work of the Holy Ghost, you would probably still get that same answer. We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. You know, it's sad, but it's true. Now, God will not do what I'm about to say. Understand that. But what if God took the Holy Ghost out of the world, uh, just, just carried him right out of this world, the Holy Spirit went back home to heaven. I'm telling you, most people sitting in the churches would be none the wiser because the truth of the matter is we depend so very little upon the Holy Spirit in these last days. Can I stop and say, ladies and gentlemen, if there's ever been a time when the church of God and God's people needed the Holy Spirit, it is in these last days in which we are living. We need the power of the the Holy Spirit of God in our services once again. So over the last three, four, five, six, I think it's number seven now, <clears throat> the last seven weeks here in our church, we've been talking a little bit about the Holy Ghost. And I basically tried to use this outline right here. First of all, number one, we need to receive the filling, notice the word filling, not feeling, but the filling of the Holy Spirit. Now the very moment you and I believe, the very moment <coughs> we trusted Jesus as our Savior, the Spirit of God moved into our heart. He took up His abode in our heart. However, He wants to do more than just live on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit of God wants to fill us to his wonderful fullness. He wants us <coughs> to operate in his power, so therefore we must receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's the reason <coughs> in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18 we read these words, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Number one, let's receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. And then a couple of weeks ago, I preached on this thought. Let's respect the feelings of the Holy Spirit. The most sensitive person <coughs> in this world today is the Holy Spirit. His feelings can be very easily hurt. The Bible said he can be very easily grieved. That's the reason in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30 we read these words, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, <coughs> whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Can I stop and say I don't have COVID? I checked myself yesterday. I've just got the cooties real bad. So if I cough on you, it'll be okay. It's not COVID. It's just preacher spit coming out of my mouth. All right, y'all pray for me this morning. We need, we need to uh, respect the feelings of the Holy Spirit. Boy, if there's any person in this world that we don't want to hurt their feelings, <coughs> it is the Holy Spirit of God. We must respect the feelings of the Holy Spirit. But then last Sunday morning, I preached on this thought. Boy, we need to release the fire. Can I have an amen? Amen. We need to release the fire of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Bible, you'll find as you work your way through the Bible, there are a number, a number of symbols, a number of emblems that represent the Holy Spirit throughout the Bible. 
uh, these symbols depict the work of the Holy Spirit. For instance, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is pictured as wind in the Bible. Jesus said in John 3, about verse number 9, He said, this, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whither it, go, whither it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is like wind. You ever been out on a hot day? <clears throat> Maybe you were mowing the yard and, and man, it was so hot and I mean the sweat was just pouring off of you and then maybe a cloud passed between the earth and the sun where you were at and a gentle breeze began to blow and all of a sudden you felt a little bit of an enlivening effect. You kind of, you know, you kind of came back to life just a little bit. Can I say that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our world today? He wants to, to so blow upon us. He wants to breathe upon us and to help us in these days. Water is a type of the Holy Spirit. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. The dove, you may remember when Jesus was baptized, the Bible said when he was baptized <coughs> that there came a voice out of heaven which said, this is my beloved son. That's the voice of God the Father. And then the Bible said the heavens opened up and the Spirit of God descended like a dove and lit upon the Lord Jesus. In the Bible, a dove is a type of the Holy Spirit, but the most frequently used emblem in the Bible, symbol for the Holy Spirit, is that of fire. And ladies and gentlemen, if there's ever been a day, the church of Jesus Christ, the church of the, the child of God, the, the, the person that has been saved, if there's ever been a day we need to release the fire of the Holy Spirit, it's in this day in which we're living, ladies and gentlemen. And yet in an amazing verse of Scripture, here's what we read. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Quench not the Spirit. Now, if you'll notice the word Spirit there, it was with a capital S. 99.5% of the time in our Bible, when you read about the Spirit with a capital S, it's always talking about the Holy Spirit. And the Bible said, it, as amazing and as astounding as what I'm about to say, the Bible says there is a possibility that you and I can quench, we can put out the fire of the Holy Spirit. Is that not amazing? Let me give you some synonyms. The word quench, we can suppress. We can smother, we can stifle the Holy Spirit of God in our midst. We can handcuff Him from doing what He desires to do in our lives individually and in our church congregationally. It is absolutely amazing and astounding to think as big as God is, and He is so big. They just sang about it just a moment ago. Our God is so big that He created everything and hung it on nothing but the nail of His own Word. He is so big, so vast, that He stokes the fires of a million suns. He causes the stars to twinkle at night. Ladies and gentlemen, that God so big, so vast, can be handcuffed by people just like you and me. We can smother, quench the person of the Holy Spirit. Now hear me, listen, hear me, and hear me well. We can put the fire of the Holy Spirit out in our lives. I'm not talking about we, we never can. Hear me and hear me well. I did not say that we can put out the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. That's an impossibility. He said when he came, he said, I'm going to abide with you forever. How long is forever? Forever. He'll never leave you. But there is a strong possibility that we can quench him. Now, make no mistake about it. I want you to hear me this morning. Make no mistake about it. There are three things the Holy Spirit wants to do for our church. Three things. Let me give them to you. Number one, the Holy Spirit wants to unite our church. Look in chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were all of one mind. There was one passion. There was one purpose. Can I say this? The Holy Spirit of God wants to unite our church. He wants us to become as one. No more factions. No more schisms. No more divisions. He desires to unite us together as one. And by the way, can I stop and say this? Ladies and gentlemen, if we're splint and fragmented and splintered, we're easily divided. But buddy, when we're together as one person, as one body, 
body. I'm telling you, there ain't enough devils in hell that can stop the progress of this church if this church will unite itself together. And the only way to unite together is through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God wants to unite us. Number two, the Holy Spirit of God wants to excite us. Can I have an amen? The Spirit of God, if you look there at verse number 2, the Bible said suddenly there came a, a, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. He wants to excite the people of God. How excited are you this morning about church? I wish we was all as excited as, uh, as uh, Brother Jay's boy over here, Austin, is. Man, that boy gets excited. When we start singing, I mean, he's all over the place. I can't help but look down there and I say, God, help me to be as excited about church as that boy right there is excited about church. Listen, this ain't a funeral. Can I have an amen? amen? Hey, this ain't a funeral. Hey, this is a worship service. And God's people ought to be excited about what God is going to do in our midst. He wants to unite us. He wants to excite us. And then what about this? He wants to ignite us. Look again at verse number 3. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. You know what happened? There were 120 Christians in the upper room in Acts chapter number 1, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit of God came in great power, and God turned them 120 Christians in an upper room to 120 candles in the streets of Jerusalem preaching the Word of God. God set that crowd on fire, and I believe God wants to set us on fire today as well. But the only way, how many times have you heard this statement before? <clears throat> I'll tell you what, man, he's on fire. Or maybe you've heard this before. I'll tell you, she's on fire. Or maybe you've heard this before. Man, I'll tell you, that church is on fire. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could put that in Bible language, what they're saying is the Spirit of God is not being quenched in his life. The Spirit of God is not being quenched in her life. The Spirit of God is not being quenched in that church. I'm telling you, if there's ever been a day we need to not quench the Spirit of God, it's in this day in which we're living. Ladies and gentlemen, if anything is going to be done, God is going to have to do it. So here's what I said about the thinking this week, and here's my message. I got to thinking this week, where in the Bible can we find a church where the Holy Spirit was not being quenched? I mean, there's got to be an example of a church that is not quenching the Spirit of God in the Bible. And obviously, Acts chapter 2 would have to be that church. In fact, early on in the life of the church, I believe the church began on the day of Pentecost. Some other people believe it began back in John chapter 20. Be that as it may. Thank God it began. Can I have an amen? And the Bible said that in those early days, the church was filled with the power of the Holy Ghost of God. He was not being smothered. He was not being stifled. He was not being suppressed. And ladies and Gentlemen, that church was on fire doing something for the glory of God. So what does a church look like where the Spirit of God is not being quenched? That's the $10 million question. I think about this church in Acts chapter 2. They did so much with so little. And the church of the last days is doing so little with so much. I'm telling you, this church had the power of the Spirit of God. This early church had nothing that you and I would deem essential for success. They had no buildings. They had no bank accounts. They had no status. They had no political influence. And yet we read of this church that they turned the world upside down. And the reason they did that is because they weren't quenching the Holy Spirit of God. Now think about us today. We have buildings. We have bank accounts. We have social status. We have political influence. A little bit of it. But whereas they rocked the world, turned the world upside down, we're not even making a ripple in the waters anymore. You know why? I'll tell you why. We're quenching the power of the Holy Spirit in our churches today. The early church depended upon nothing but the power of the Holy Spirit, while the church of the first 21st century depends upon everything but the power of the Holy Spirit. We have got to get back to the place where we take the cuffs off and say, okay, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, whatever you want me, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. I will not quench the Holy Spirit of God. Can I have an amen? amen. Now listen to this. I read about this week about this vacuum cleaner salesman. And so he uh, 
One day he grabbed his vacuum cleaner in his hand, and I mean all of the attachments that went with it, and he headed out going to sell some vacuum cleaners. Well, he drove way out in the country, thinking to himself, what better place to sell a vacuum cleaner than way out in the country? So he goes up with his vacuum cleaner in hand, and he knocks on the door, and this lady came to the door, and he said, ma'am, introduced himself, and he said, I am here to tell you about the best vacuum cleaner that money can buy. He had all the attachments to it. He told her he could clean her house from top to bottom like it had never been cleaned before. The lady said, you know, that sounds good, but he said, ma'am, no, ma'am, no buts about it. I'm here to tell you this is the greatest vacuum cleaner that money can buy. He said, in fact, that pile of dust <coughs> that you've swept up, all them dust bunnies, all that dust there. He said, I guarantee you my vacuum cleaner can get all of that up or lady, I promise you I'll eat it with a knife and a fork. She looked back at him and she said, you might as well get your knife and your fork out because we ain't got no electricity out here. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, can I tell you that's the way the church is of the last days? We have all the fancy buildings. We have all the attachments that go along with it. But we don't have the power of God anymore. And I'm here to tell you if anything's going to get done, it's going to get done because of the power of God. Can I have an amen? I've said too often around here, many of us, most of us have been to Calvary for pardon, but too few of us have been to Pentecost for power. Oh, I want to tell you, we need to let the cuffs off. We need to let the fire of the Spirit of God burn in our midst once again because I'm telling you, good things happen when we fail to quench the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. So let me show you in our text this morning. I'll be quick about this. But let me show you in Acts chapter 2 what a church that's not quenching the Holy Spirit looks like, all right? Or let me show you better yet, the results of an unquenched spirit in the church. First of all, look at Acts chapter number 2. Let me say this, when the church is not quenching the Holy Spirit, watch this now, number one, there's going to be conviction of sin. <laughs> when the church is not quenching, smothering, stifling, suppressing the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, when the Spirit of God, the Bible said where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. In a church where the Spirit of God has liberty to work at, I'm going to tell you something, the first result of that is there's going to be some old-fashioned conviction of sin. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't see a whole lot of conviction much no more, do we? I remember a day growing up in church and the, and the tears would fall and the mascara would run and people would make their way to an altar and cry out to God for forgiveness. We don't see that a whole lot no more. You know why? I'll tell you why. I believe because we're quenching the power of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Let me show you in our text. Look at Acts chapter number 2. According to verse number 14, Peter stood up and Peter started preaching. And the end result of his preaching was when he got through preaching, the Bible said that the people were cut to their heart. You know what that tells me? There was some conviction of sin uh, in a church where the Spirit of God's not being quenched. There's some old-fashioned conviction again in the church. You and I agree with this. Nobody can be saved without being convicted by the Holy Spirit of God. We believe that. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draw him. We believe that. I'm not Calvinist. I'm not even in the same zip code as a Calvinist. But ladies and gentlemen, I still believe that nobody can get saved apart from the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't want to confuse you about that. I don't want to make you feel like you've got to wait for some kind of special feeling. If you know you're lost, you know you're on your way to hell, and you know Jesus is the way out, friend, I'm here to tell you, you know enough to get saved this morning. But ladies and gentlemen, nobody gets saved without being convicted by the Holy Spirit. So Peter stands up, verse 14, and he begins to preach. I want you to look at his message real fast this morning. There are four essential ingredients that went into the message of old Simon Peter. First of all, notice there was an expounding of the Scripture. Uh, he keeps referring to the Word of God. Over and over again in this message on the day of Pentecost, he keeps quoting Scripture. Look at verse number uh, 16, if you will. 
The Bible said, but this, in his message, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he reaches back into the Old Testament in the book of Joel chapter number 2 and he quotes some, some verses. He is expounding the word of God. Look again at verse number 25. The Bible said in verse 25, for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. He is on my right hand. I should. And then he reaches back and he quotes again from the Old Testament in Psalms chapter 16. Look at verse 34. The Bible said in verse 34, he quotes again from the words of David in Psalms 110 verse number 1. Can I just stop and say, what's Peter doing? He's preaching the Bible, friend. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You didn't come to church this morning to hear the thoughts of some preacher. You come to hear the Word of God. And the Word of God will still get the job done in our day if preachers will get back to preaching the Word of God again, friend and not be afraid of this woke culture that we're living in where anything and everything goes on. Look, friend, if that book says it, it's still true. If that book's for it, we need to be for it. If that book is against it, we ought to be against it. I'm telling you, preach the Word, friend. The Word will get the job done. He expounded the Scripture, but then I like this. He exalted the Savior. Can I have an amen? He lifted Jesus. It isn't long in his message till he makes his way to Jesus. And I'll tell you, friend, you'll never go wrong preaching the Bible and preaching about Jesus. In verse number 22, he begins to preach about Jesus. In verse number 32 and verse 33, he begins to preach about Jesus. In verse number 36, he begins to mention Jesus. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for the answers this morning, you'll not find it in the Baptist. The Baptists don't have the answer. The Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Pentecostals, they ain't got the answer. But bless your heart, I can tell you the answer is still Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. And whatever you're looking for, you'll find in the person of Jesus Christ. He exalted the Savior. He expounded the Scripture. Then I like this, He exposed the sin. Amen. Nobody's ever going to get saved till they understand that they're lost. And nobody's ever going to understand their loss till they're first of all confronted about their sin. Now the Bible said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Can I have it? Every one of them. I don't think I'd have to have uh, spend time convincing anybody in here that we're all sinners. We've all told lies. We've all took things, said things, done things, thought things that are wrong in the sight of God. And what Peter does, he begins to preach the Bible. He takes them to Jesus. He exposes their sin. He accuses uses them of killing the very Son of God. Look at verse 23. He said, Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Peter stands up that day and he says, I'll tell you, we're all guilty of putting the Son of God to death on the cross of Calvary. Not everybody in this room, hopefully, has committed homicide. Not everybody in this room, hopefully, has committed matricide, killed your mama. Not everybody in this this room has committed patricide. Hopefully you've never killed your daddy. Maybe you haven't committed feticide. Hopefully you hadn't killed a little baby. I know for sure you've not committed suicide because you hadn't. You wouldn't be here if you had. But we may not be guilty of all those things, but every last one of us in this room is guilty of committing deicide because it was our sin that put the Son of God on the cross of Calvary that he had to die for. I'm guilty and so are you, friend. We're guilty of that. Oh, friend, we're guilty of killing the Son of God. Oh, yeah, you're guilty. I'm guilty. I know the actual ones, the Romans and the Jews that put him on the cross. But, buddy, it's not the actual ones that gets me. It's the absent ones that gets me because I was just as much there and responsible for the death of the Son of God and you are just as responsible as the death for the death of the Son of God as the Romans and, and the Jews were that day because it was our sins. He died for our sins, your sins, my sins. We're guilty of killing God's Son, Jesus Christ. We're guilty. He exposed their sin. But then I like this. He exhorted the sinner. Look at verse 40. What did he exhort them to do? Look at verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward. You know what he exhorted them to do? To repent. To repent. You know what I want to tell you to do today if you're here and you've never been saved? You need to repent this morning. Look at verse number 37. I, I'm going to wrap this up. Look at verse 37. Now, when they heard this, 
They were pricked in their hearts. I like that. They were stabbed in their hearts. They felt a sense of guilt and condemnation come upon them. They saw Jesus for who Jesus really was, the Son of God. They saw the part that they had, the hand that they had in putting him to death on the cross of Calvary. And the Bible said in verse 37, they were pricked. You know what we call that? Conviction. They felt a sense of guilt and condemnation. Boy, if there's one thing we ought to pray for in these last days, it's for conviction to be in our services. But I am afraid we have so quenched the Holy Spirit of God. You know, people used to shout in church. And I still think the Holy Spirit every once in a while says, you ought to shout right here. But you know what? We're so afraid of what somebody else is going to think about us. I think a spirit, you know what? I believe, I really believe more people would want what we have if they see us enjoying it a little bit more. We walk around with a coffin under one arm and a tombstone under the other arm and look at a world that's already up to their eyeballs in trouble and say, hey, y'all want some of this right here? But I tell you, if they could see something real in your life and in my life, and the only way they're going to see that is if we stop quenching the Holy Spirit of God and give Him freedom and liberty to work in it. I'm telling you, I believe conviction will come back when God's people quit quenching the Holy Spirit. Can I have an amen? There's going to be conviction of sin. I like this. Notice number two. Here's a second result of a church where the Spirit of God is not being quenched. There's not only conviction of sin, but there's conversion of sinners. There'll be some people who get saved if God's people will quit quenching, smothering, stifling, suppressing the Holy Spirit of God. Look at verse 37. They were pricked in their heart and they said, hey, what do we need to do? Well, I'll tell you, that's a good question to ask, isn't it? That's a question folks will be asking when they get under conviction. What do I need to do? That old Philippian jailer, man, when he got under conviction that night, he said to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? They're going to start asking questions. Hey, what's going on? What's happening here? Why are they so happy? Why is there so much joy and excitement in this fellowship? And they'll start asking those questions. They say, hey, if you had what we had, you'd be just excited, as excited about it. Look what happened in our text, verse 38. Now stay with me right here. I'm not going to get tied up in this. I want to say some things. Look at verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you think that Peter is emphasizing baptism and uh, baptismal essential, baptism essential for salvation. I don't think that's the point at all. For years, people have tried to use this verse to uh, prove the point that people have to be baptized to be saved. You know what I call that crowd? I call them the Lord's Navy. Their favorite song is not Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Their favorite song is Amazing Water, How Sweet the Splash. These men say, what do we need to do? And Peter says, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to repent. You need to repent and you need to get baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. Repentance is when you're convicted and you change your mind about your sin, about yourself, and about your Savior. But let me say this. When you change your mind about sin, self, and Savior, you're going to change how you live then. Repentance is a change of mind that will lead to a change of living. And then he said this, repent. Then he said this, be baptized. Be baptized. Now we know, we know that baptism doesn't confer salvation. Baptism confirms salvation. Baptism is not the source of salvation. It is the sign of of salvation. When you repent and you receive Christ as your Savior, the next step you take in your life is the step of being baptized. I heard about this little girl. She was over in the children's church and she went down the aisle and she got saved and, and the preacher said, all right. She said, what do I need to do now? She said, he said, leave here. Go over there into the big church. Walk down the aisle. When the preacher says, what can he help you with? You tell him you want to get baptized. You've been saved. She walked down the aisle. The preacher met her there and said, what can I help you with? She said, preacher, I just got saved over there and I come over here to get advertised. <laughs> Can I tell you what baptism is? An advertisement, friend. An advertisement that you have been saved by the grace of God. 
Now, baptism is always spoken of in the Bible as believers' baptism. And let me say this. Now, look at me. Let me say this. If you're going to use Acts 2.38 to prove that a person has to be baptized to go to heaven, you're going to have some real problems as you move farther into the book of Acts. Let me show you some of the problems you're going to have. Look at Acts chapter 3. Look at verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Hold it. I don't read anything about baptism there. Go over to Acts, if you will, Acts chapter 8 and verse number 35. You got some problems. Look at Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Here's what the Word of God said. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, Read it with me. If thou believeth with all thine heart, thou man. And he said, He answered and said, I believe that Jesus. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It is believers' baptism. Go over to Acts chapter 10 and verse 43. Look at this verse right here. To him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. You're going to have some real problems if you're going to use Acts 2.38 to prove water baptism is essential for salvation. You're going to have some real problems as you move through the Word of God because there are verses that teach us that the only thing that is required for salvation is faith and the finished work of the Son of God, the Lord. Now, wait a minute. I'm not saying baptism is not important. Every believer ought to get baptized. Can I have an amen? Everybody's been saved ought to get baptized, but you you go to heaven dry clean if you want to, but you're disobeying the Word of God if you don't get baptized. Can I have an amen? And what happened was on the day of, of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was not greed, we read over in the same chapter in verse 41 that 3,000 folks got saved. Look at Acts 2.41. The Bible said this in verse 41, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000. Can I look at me? Can I tell you the miracle of Pentecost? The miracle of Pentecost was not the sights or the sound, or the speech. The miracle of Pentecost was the souls that got saved. And ladies and gentlemen, it is a miracle every time somebody gets saved. I'm just saying in a church where the Spirit is not quenched, there'll be a conviction of sin. There'll be conversion of sinners. And what about this? There'll be confession of saints. Look at Acts chapter 2. I'm, I'm done. I'm coming in for a landing. We got to go. I know. Bear with me. I'm almost done. Look at verse 14. But Peter standing up with the... Say the next word. Eleven. Now hold it. Hold it. We got a problem here. Because in Acts chapter number 1 and John chapter number 20, Peter and the eleven were scared to death. Peter and the eleven, talking about the other disciples along with all of the followers of Jesus. And in John chapter 20, they're behind locked doors. And the Bible very plainly says it was for fear of the Jews. They were scared to death. They thought the same thing that happened to Jesus was about to happen to them. They were scared. They were behind locked We come to Acts chapter 1, they're still in that upper room. They're still behind locked doors. But then we come to Acts 2 and verse number 14. Now they've left that upper room. They're down in the streets of Jerusalem. They're standing up and they're getting ready to preach. Question, what's happened? What brought them out of that fear into, into this public arena testifying about Jesus? Why, why are they no longer behind closed doors? Why are they in the streets telling others, everybody that will hear them about the Lord? I'll tell you what happened to them. They stopped quenching the Holy Ghost. And when they quit quenching the Spirit of God, great, great faith came where there was once great fear. And they left the upper room, moved down into the busy streets of Jerusalem, and they started boldly proclaiming the gospel. And 3,000 people walked the aisle and got saved. What made the difference? It was when they quit quenching the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit told you to do that you didn't do? Can I tell you? You quenched him. When he tells you to hit your feet and testify and you sit there, and, and, and here's the reason, because we're afraid. 
What's so-and-so going to think about me if I stand up and testify? So what do we do? We quench the Holy Spirit. Smother Him, stifle Him, suppress Him. And maybe that's the reason ain't nobody much getting saved no more. When the Holy Spirit of God said, you know what you need to do? You need to go ahead and take a lap around the building. And we sit in our seat and don't do it. We're quenching the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Spirit says, stand up and shout. And we sit back. We're quenching the Holy Spirit. We're smothering Him. We're stifling Him. We are suppressing Him. And ladies and gentlemen, we're doing ourselves a great disservice when we quench the Holy Spirit of God. I just like, I'd like to be a part, before I go to heaven, I'd like to be a part of one service where the handcuffs were took off. I'd like to be a part of one service where everybody walked in the door and said, man, I'll tell you whatever the Holy Spirit tells me to do. You say, preacher, but what if it's wrong? Are you kidding me? The Holy Spirit's going to tell you to do something wrong. I don't believe that for a second. You say, but preacher, wh what if it makes me look like an idiot? Watch this. Are you kidding me? So the Holy Spirit's going to make you look like an idiot. Are you kidding me? Not on your life, friend. It'll be done decent. It'll be in order. And I tell you what it'll do. It'll give a great testimony to the lost that's sitting around you. Those folks got something I ain't got. But when they walk in here and we're no different than they are, when they walk in here, they see no excitement, no, in, no joy, no enthusiasm. We just come in, sit down, flop down, and about half asleep during the... Can I... Got our phones out playing, bless God, Sudoku on the phone or whatever you do on the phone. Pac-Man. Atari or whatever it is on, did you do on your And we're doing all that when church. No wonder they don't want what we got. It ain't enough to get us excited. Man, I'm telling you, why should they want that? They already got enough troubles as it is. Why should they add one more trouble to an already over-troubled life? I'm telling you, it's time we quit quenching the Holy Spirit and just see what God can do for us. Can I have an amen? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I pray.